Hey guys and welcome back. If you missed the previous video, make sure you go back and check out part one for an introduction to this project. Today, I just wanted to give you guys a short progress update to show you how things are going since the last video. First up though, here's a quick look at the process of printing and finishing the final prototype housing. As you can see, the 3D printed prototype housing has come together quite nicely. I printed all of the parts face down to keep the inside faces as clean as possible to minimise the amount of support material I have to remove. The trade off is that the outside surface obviously needs more of a clean up, but I find that's generally easier than attempting to sand and fill the insides of the housing. I'm using quite an old and basic 3D printer, so most of you should be able to pull this print off without any difficulty. One of the next hurdles I'm trying to overcome is getting the NUC and the display driver connected to each other within the confines of the housing. My plan is to replace the HDMI ports with a 19 pin FFC connector and run the ribbon cable between the two devices. The display driver complicates things however, as it has a mini HDMI port, meaning the pin spacing and order doesn't match a full size HDMI port. I know you can get mini HDMI to ribbon cable adapters, but I don't have enough room to be able to fit one of those in the current design. To solve this, I devised this little PCB that solders directly on top of the display driver board and breaks the signals out to the correct spacing and order for a full-sized HDMI port. Unfortunately, despite many attempts, I haven't been able to get it to solder on correctly with all of the pins making contact, and in the process, I've managed to damage the traces of the driver board. After a bit of thinking, I decided the best course of action is to find a display driver with a full-sized HDMI that will still fit in the housing, so that's what I did. The driver board I've picked has a full-size HDMI port along with a headphone jack and a stereo speaker output. I'm unsure how any of that works yet, as there is little to no information about these devices online, but I'll give it a test when it turns up. It's not all bad news though, as the first revision of the right side controller PCBs have arrived, so it's time to get building. This half of the controller features a Raspberry Pi Pico, an MPU6050 module, controller mode toggle switch, and the system information display. The controller is made up of a stack of two PCBs. The lower half mounts all the buttons, switches, and the display, whilst the upper half is home to the Pico, the MPU module, the right trigger hall effect sensor, and the joystick. The signals are carried between the boards by a 20-pin FFC. I've found a few issues with the design already, but nothing bad enough to stop me so far, so I've been able to work around them to continue testing. I'm still waiting for some parts in the mail, so I haven't been able to connect the joystick or the MPU module yet, but I should have them for the next video. After assembling the PCBs, I spent some time writing the beginning of the software for the controller. There's still a lot to be done, but here's a quick look at what I've got so far. On the home screen, you'll have a battery indicator with a percentage readout and a battery status indicator to show you if the system is charging or discharging. I should be able to incorporate a time to empty estimate once I have a functioning battery management system in place. The mode toggle switch simply switches between gamepad and keyboard mode as some games don't have very good controller support. I'd like to have the keyboard mapping for the controller fully customizable from the LCD display along with macro support, but that will have to wait until the core functionality of the controller is done before I'll know if there's enough memory left on the controller to be able to achieve that. 
A press of the menu button opens the controller's inbuilt menu and disables all of the controls from interfering with the system. Eventually the D-pad will navigate this menu and I will use the A and B buttons for select and back. Until I have the other side of the controller hooked up, I have set up X and Y to be up and down in the menu. The aim assist option in the menu is just a toggle to enable and disable the setting quickly. The calibrate option will step you through a joystick and trigger calibration sequence. The battery menu will have more in-depth information about the health of the battery and the settings menu will be used to configure the key mapping, joystick dead zones, aim assist strength and RGB settings for the joystick surrounds. I've also purchased all of the necessary materials so the next episode will be full of CNC work as I begin making parts for the final version of the housing. I have a few other projects in the works at the same time so I may have a few videos in between the Nuckdeck series whilst I work on the power management side of things so make sure you subscribe if you don't want to miss out on the updates. See you next time.